In this Warmaster video we shall take a look at the Tomb King's army. This was the first Warmaster army that I collected when the game was released over 20 years ago. Back then the army list was simply called Undead, as it predates the release of the Tomb Kings in Warhammer Fantasy by a couple of years. This means the Warmaster army list is the template upon which the Warhammer Tomb Kings faction was based. The Tomb Kings are essentially a skeletal fantasy version of the ancient Egyptians from our own history. Their homeland of Nehekara is a desert land inhabited by only skeletons, ruled over by undying pharaohs. The Tomb Kings are a neutral faction. They care little for the world or races beyond their own lands. However, the Undying Legions can swiftly be roused to anger should an enemy encroach upon their territory or seek to steal their riches. And the Tomb Kings can raise mighty hordes indeed, their land being filled with countless warriors preserved in living death due to the treachery of Nagash. In Warmaster, this is represented by the Tomb Kings being a Horde faction, with their mandatory troop choices being some of the cheapest in the game. When you play as Tomb Kings, you would generally outnumber your opponent, which gives you a psychological advantage. It does mean, however, that you'll have to collect and paint an awful lot of models. Playing as the Tomb Kings can be a very rewarding experience, provided you can pass your command rolls and get your spells off. This makes the Tomb Kings somewhat of a gambler's army. If you can't pass your command rolls, your troops will do nothing as they have no initiative, whilst your powerful spell list is essential for tipping the balance in your favour. The Tomb Kings, as an undead faction, do not operate like normal living troops. In Warmaster, this is represented by the entire army having the following special rules. No unit may act on initiative, which means you can make no initiative charges and no initiative evades. However, none of your units will suffer a command penalty if they are given orders when close to enemy units. None of your troops will suffer an attack penalty if forced to fight terrifying foes. And none of your units can ever be confused. The Tomb King's army list features nine different types of troop choice and only two different types of character. You must take two skeletons and two skeleton bowmen for every thousand points in your list. You must also take one Tomb King and I would advise taking as many wizards as you can afford. Skeleton chariots are your hammer units and the best quality troops in your army. You also have access to very good flyers and decent artillery, but don't expect too much from the rest of your troops. Skeletons are your only melee infantry choice and they are the worst melee infantry in the game. As mentioned before, because the list was written before the Tomb Kings became their own faction, you won't find any Tomb Guard or Ushabti here. In a straight up fight, skeletons will lose against almost every other unit in the game. The good news is that skeletons are very cheap. So take as many skeleton units as you need to raise your breakpoint, try to keep them in defended terrain wherever possible, and use them to support your archers and protect your artillery. Your skeleton archers, however, are actually quite good. If you can focus enough units missile fire against the same target, skeleton archers can prove quite deadly. They are, however, extremely fragile in combat, so should be protected in defendable terrain as much as possible. Their greatest strength is that they cannot be confused. Always try and support your skeleton archers with a unit of skeleton warriors behind. This means that if the enemy target your skeleton archers with their own missile fire, the supporting unit can refuse to make way when your archers are driven back into them. Normally this would cause your archers to become automatically confused, but on skeleton archers it has no effect, 
This means enemy missile fire against your archers will have to focus enough to remove a whole stand, otherwise it will have no effect at all. At first glance skeleton cavalry appears very weak, and if you try and engage enemy cavalry with your own you will lose. But skeleton cavalry is extremely cheap to the point of being under costed, and this means you should always have room for a couple of units in your army. By far the best use for your skeleton cavalry is as mobile protection for your chariots. Your cavalry has the same number of hits and the same armor save as your chariots, so always keep them closer to the enemy shooter to keep your chariots safe. Another use for skeleton cavalry is as a raised dead delivery system. Send your cavalry charging into combat, then move your wizards close enough to summon raised dead into the fight. Even if you end up losing the combat, you've managed to add a unit to your army which the enemy now must deal with. Skeleton chariots are the best unit in your army, always take as many of them as you can afford. The best way to use chariots is to catch the enemy in the open, never send them against defended positions. If you can't charge the enemy in your turn, use the chariot's missile attacks to drive the enemy back and confuse them. And if you are unlucky enough for your own chariots to be charged by the enemy, use their shooting attack to stand and shoot which may tip the balance in your favour. Carrion are excellent flying monsters. Their stat line is identical to eagles but they are 5 points cheaper. This is because carrion cannot use their initiative. Your carrion can be used to kill off enemy flyers or assault enemy artillery. You can also fly them behind the enemy lines to impose command modifiers but you do run the risk of leaving them stranded out of your command range. One way to mitigate this is to mount a lich priest on a dragon and keep him nearby. But beware of a wily enemy jumping on your character and killing him and your flyers in one go. But you all know the best tactic for flyers, drop them just behind a combat you're about to win and they will wipe out the enemy as they retreat. The Bone Giant is your damage dealing monster. It can dish out an impressive 8 attacks on the charge and has a healthy 4 plus save to protect it. One use for the Bone Giant is to attack the flanks of enemy cavalry or enemy monster units. Another use is to act as a bodyguard to your vulnerable infantry and artillery to deter attacks from enemy flyers. However, don't expect your Bone Giant to win a combat against defended enemy on its own. If you can spare the points for them, a Bone Giant is an entertaining addition to your list. The Sphinx is the opposite to the Bone Giant. It won't cause much damage to the enemy, but it has the capacity to absorb an awful lot of hits. This makes the Sphinx very good for use as an arrow catcher. You can position it ahead of the rest of the army as the closest target to the enemy shooters. And provided the enemy has no armour piercing damage, their shots will have little effect upon the Sphinx. Another use for the Sphinx is to block enemy cavalry charges. The Sphinx's combination of terror and a 3 up armour save is usually enough to bounce even a determined cavalry charge. This makes them a good bodyguard choice for your chariots. The Skull Chucker is a very good artillery piece. Its shooting attacks ignore armour and it will confuse enemy when driving them back on the roll of 4 plus. If you choose to take skull chuckers, always take at least two of them and use your skeleton infantry as blinkers to block their line of sight to unfavourable targets. This way you have a good chance of removing an entire stand of the enemy when you shoot and leaving the survivors confused. A confused enemy can't charge you and can't move, leaving them a sitting duck for next turn. The Bone Throwers are an interesting artillery choice. They also ignore armour with their shooting attacks, and they can generate a lot of attacks against enemy in column formation. On the downside however their range is only 40 centimetres and it can be hard to pick a viable target. Still, an artillery brigade of 2 units of bone throwers and 2 units of skull chuckers can generate 
14 armour piercing shots at 40 centimetres and this can be enough to erase even the most heavily armoured units in one go. Your Tomb King is a decent general with a command value of 9. He is also the only character in the army with a command range greater than 20 centimetres. As your wizards will move around the battlefield to cast their spells, it often falls to the Tomb King to actually get the units moving. Therefore take extra care when placing your general to ensure that he can command as many troops as possible. The Tomb King also has a very good special ability which allows him to add plus one to the attacks of every stand in a unit within 20 centimetres. And the effects last for the entirety of the combat phase which can be up to four rounds of combat. The best target for this ability will be your chariots. Your only other characters are your Lich Priests and as they are wizards their command range is only 20 centimetres which makes it important to take as many as you can. They have a good command value of 8 and they also have an attack which we might imagine is their magical ability to make their troops fight harder. This means it's often worthwhile mounting the Lich Priests on a chariot and giving them a magic sword to boost their combat prowess. The Zombie Dragon is also a good character mount for a Lich Priest. It provides you with a mobile force multiplier bringing terror to anywhere on the battlefield and their hefty three attacks will help turn the tide in combat. The best reason to take as many wizards as you can is the Amazing Tomb King's spell list. In my opinion, Raise Dead is the best spell in Warmaster. The ability to add an extra unit to the army which gives up no victory points and no breakpoints is game winning. The unit has to be raised as part of a combat which makes it all the more important to pass your command rolls and get units to charge. Because once you're in combat you can move your priests over and try and raise dead into the engagement. In combat the raise dead will either add up to 6 extra attacks or add support. And even if their attacks are not enough to win the combat, you've still created an enemy unit right in the middle of enemy lines which will mess up their command rolls. The raised dead units are entirely expendable and can be used to launch suicidal charges against other enemy units into which you can then raise more dead. This can create a snowball effect where you have so many units of raised dead on the table the enemy cannot deal with them. Doom and Despair is another excellent spell. It is a natural safety net in your army if you fail your command rolls. Should you fail to engage the enemy hammer units with your own, simply get your priests to cast Doom and Despair on the greatest enemy threat to prevent them charging you in their turn. With 60 centimeter range and a 4 plus to cast, Doom and Despair is a very useful tool in your arsenal. The remaining Tomb King spells, Death Bolts and Touch of Death are both good but situational and should only really be considered if you have no viable targets for either Raise Dead or Doom and Despair. As tempting as it may be, never make a list entirely of skeletons, you will never win. You can opt for a lot of monsters in your list and this can be viable in certain situations but not if the enemy has cannon. Your breakpoint will also suffer. A safer bet might be to go magic heavy with as many spellcasters as you can and as many magic items to boost their spellcasting as you can. This also gives you more flexibility with command. Or you may just want to take as many different unit types as you can and provided you include at least some chariots and more than two wizards, you can't go far wrong. So why should you play Tomb Kings? Well, it is a horde army, and in my opinion it's the best at being a horde army in the game, as it has the best chance of actually increasing the size of its army the longer the game goes on, due to a large number of wizards and the raised dead spell. Tomb Kings are a good army if you want to learn to play the game, as the Tomb Kings roster includes all different unit types in the game. Another reason is Spectacle. A well painted Tomb Kings army on a desert themed board looks fantastic. 
If you enjoy the challenge of getting multiple components to work well together and units to be in the right place at the right time, this could be the army for you. Try not to get too frustrated though if you fail all your command rolls turn after turn and your army just sits there and does nothing. Try and come up with contingencies so that if plan A fails you've always got plan B. Tomb King's magic is one of their greatest strengths and helps make up for their lack of initiative. Their shooting is also plentiful and powerful, although it can be quite hard to concentrate fire against a worthy target. You also have some good terror causing options in the list, and all of your troops are immune to terror, which means as bad as they may be, they're not going to get any worse. Your chariots are some of the best in the game as they have a missile attack, but be careful to protect them as without your chariots you effectively have no hammer. Your flyers are also excellent, but their lack of initiative can be frustrating as they will always require orders. You have access to some of the cheapest troops in the game and can use them to build an impressive breakpoint, but don't let the enemy near them. And the fact that your army can never be confused means you will always get the chance to order them around. Conversely, the greatest weakness of the army is its lack of decent infantry. The only infantry units you should ever really send into combat are your raised dead. And if the enemy field any heavy infantry of their own, especially in defendable terrain, you have no chance of getting them out. Save the tough nuts in the enemy army for your monsters and chariots to crush underfoot. Your cavalry is also weak and will crumble if attacked by enemy heavy cavalry. Instead, use your cavalry to attack targets of opportunity like enemy artillery or missile units and also use them as sacrificial pawns to lure the enemy units into a trap where your chariots can counter-strike. Finally, always make sure your wizards are within command range of at least one unit. Your command range is very short and it's easy to get sidetracked with casting spells and forget to use your wizards to actually issue commands. So what tactics might the enemy employ to destroy your Tomb King's army? Well, taking out your hammer units early on is a sure way to stop you winning, as without your chariots you don't have many options to take out the enemy. Nullifying your magic will also tip the balance in your enemy's favour. Large numbers of heavy infantry will also pose a bit of a problem for your army, and anything that reduces your character's command value will also be a big problem. All of this means that fighting your games on tables filled with defensible terrain gives your enemy an advantage. Oh, and if you play siege battles, good luck being the attacker with only skeletons at your command. Despite these weaknesses, Tomb Kings are still a very competitive army. And hopefully this video has provided you with some ideas of how to lead them to victory. not serve. You may deign to be in my majesty. Bow before your king. Marvel at my pyramid. Know that you will never achieve such majesty.